I'm here. Uh, congratulations again, can I add my to theirs. Uh, I think you were selected very carefully. And part of the reason is, of course, everybody wants to put their best foot forward. You know, you'll be interacting with people from MIT and from Tokyo Tech and USP in Brazil and many other, and uh, you'll want to put your best foot forward. But the reason you were selected so carefully is not principally that. It's because our intention is to show you some practices from MIT and to think about how we can adapt them to your own universities. And so you'll be part of that team implementing that adaptation. So my remarks today, I'm going to begin with CDIO. That is the overall framework that we're working within. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a particular course at MIT, 2007, that we're considering to bring to your university or to adapt in some way. Then Robocon, the actual event that you're going to be participating in for the first two weeks with all the other international organizations. And then finally, that third week, the one where it will be just these partner universities working together with us, processing some of the phenomena that we saw in the first two weeks. Before I be dive into it, let me also say that the most important thing that I do it with the time allotted to me is to elicit and answer your questions. So please stick your hand up or just shout out, you know, whatever is your question. Anything yet? Yes, yeah, Sheila. No. Is this the <laughs> Okay. So CDIO stands for Conceive, Design, Implement, Operate. So Conceive. It's a word to mention the earliest phases of something beginning. You know, you have an idea, it's just being born, that's the conception of the idea. So we start at the very beginning, then design, work out the details that you're, of the thing that you're creating, implement, actually build it. Well, CDIO is broad enough to cover things like software too, so if you don't have to build it, you still have to implement it and then operate. And we want to do all those things. It's the end to the end process. And we use it as a framework for engineering education in the CDIO effort. Uh, now, this provides a context for us to deliver the fundamentals. It doesn't replace the fundamentals. So we continue to stress mathematics, physics, chemistry, thermodynamics, solid mechanics, all of the engineering sciences that we need to build the systems of the future, the energy systems, the transmission, the software that will control it. Uh, so we need to learn those fundamentals just as much as we ever did. But we want to use CDIO to create a context so you know why you're doing it. And also, as we add these design, build, test projects into the curriculum, at least, you know, we always have one at the end, the capstone, at least one at the beginning, a cornerstone probably many others interspersed within in order to constantly reinforce. So exactly how that is structured depends on the local university, but there are many design experiences, many CDIO experiences, because they also deliver a number of skills that we view as essential. You think of communication, understanding the social context of your work, teamwork, Right? Not always all at the same time, but over the course of four or five years, you need to become proficient in all these skills so that you can really be effective within your organization. So CDIO does that. And CDIO is not a static thing. It's constantly improving over time. And in fact, you're coming into the organization now as part of that constant process of improvement. So now I'll talk just a little bit about that history. I borrow this particular graphic from the uh, CDIO website. I will, I will make these slides available to everyone. I'll show you the site where I put them, stellar.mit.edu. So you don't have to take notes right now. This is all available to you. But this is from a particular website about CDIO and its internationalization. And you see where it starts, 1997. I feel a great personal connection to this slide because it's almost the same as my career post-PhD. I earned my PhD in 1997, see this? And it said, CDIO started in MIT Aero Astro. You know me as a 
a professor of mechanical engineering, but I was hired by Aero Astro first. I came out with my PhD and I was so excited to do, to do research and also innovate in education. And Aero Astro was doing that the most of any. So I, I sent my application to the department head and he looked at it and he said, he called me on the phone and he said, Dan, this looks like a really good resume, but I'm sorry we can't move forward because I don't see enough aeronautics and astronauts in there. I said, oh, I don't know if you noticed that I was a pilot in the Navy. And he said, oh, never mind. And then they hired me. <laughs> That's it. So I was lucky. Yeah. It's a good thing I did that. So anyway, I started in this. I, I was able to watch Aero Astro decide what the syllabus was and what it meant and how to implement it. I got to see it right from the beginning and watch it develop. And in fact, here you see they, they initiated it with Swedish universities first. That was the first international application. And there I was in Sweden. And then they brought it to Singapore, and then we started a new university in Singapore over this period here. So I was lucky to be part of all of that. And now you see, well, this timeline ended in 2015 there, but actually, you know, it's four years after that. And since then, you know, Egypt has joined the CDIO initiative and is, I think, quite actively involved. What year was that that Egypt first started participating in CDIO? 2018. 2018, okay, so I put it after 2015, so that's still accurate. And then the COE is launching, and the future goes out into here, right? Way out here, that's what we're emphasizing now. We're going to take CEIO to the next level. Now, I'll have to erase everything. Erase all, come back. Erase all, yes. Just do that on every slide. It's good, because if I used a real pen, I would not be able to do that. <laughs> okay, so this is a description from a book, a book about CDIO. Now, I was going to bring books for every single one of you and hand them out today, but my backpack was too full. So instead, I put the, the, the most essential chapters on the Robocon website. So when you go to the Robocon website, you'll see the chapters there. If you want to see more, it's there. Uh, this is from one of those chapters from the book, Rethinking Engineering Education, the CDIO Approach. And what this describes is, at a very high level, what is the CDIO syllabus. The CDIO syllabus is a listing of those things that we want the modern engineer to have mastered. And this, there are pages and pages of detail, but this graphic tells you the general idea. You see the very biggest bubble here is analytical reasoning, problem solving, experimentations, and systems thinking. Those are the most important ones. You see they're bigger, maybe four times bigger than every other bubble. Maybe it's half of everything. It's still very, very important. Engineering reasoning, how you think. Experimentation, how do you fill the gaps in knowledge between what you have already learned and what you need to fill in in order to be successful on a project. Thinking about it as a system. But many other things too, teamwork, communication, ethics. This is the CDIO syllabus. And we want all of that to be delivered in the Egyptian universities. And that's why we're overall undertaking this effort. Okay, now I'm gonna to switch to from CDIO very generally to 2007, a course that actually preceded CDIO, but is very much in the same spirit. Uh, so before I switch between CDIO and 2007, what are your questions about CDIO? Okay, so this is the first slide of a presentation I made. You see, today is not 2013, February 5th. Today is, you know, much later. Uh, but this is the slide from that presentation because I'm going to, now on that day, I told the students about 2007. And after 2013, I handed over the course to a new faculty member who we had hired recently. And he taught the course, and now he just earned tenure. So this is also part of the process. We start to do something. We bring it to the next generation, and we continue on, right? So that's the next step. Let's deliver something like 2007, or at least the most appropriate parts, 
to the next generation. So this is the first slide. This note in red is, was for them, not for you. We, we got a card from them. We asked them, what was your experience so far with CAD? Because we wanted to deliver CAD instruction, computer-aided design instruction, that was appropriate. If they already knew a lot of CAD, we would teach them a little less of that and emphasize machine design instead. Those students who had not had any exposure, we gave them a little extra boost, some evening sessions, right? So we're tailoring to the, to the students. Now, what you see over here was the announcement of that year's contest. So this board was a board on which little robots started, one on the red and one on the blue, and they go out and do a bunch of tasks. So every year that we start to roll something, we have to tell them what those tasks are. And we always try to make them cover different domains of engineering, some which are very energetic, okay? So you have to apply a large force. Like here, there are these two posts, and you have to pull a heavy rubber band and set it on there. So you had to put energy into the rubber band. Here, this uh, little beaver here had a heart problem, so you gave him an angioplasty. You filled up a balloon and cleared out his aorta. Okay. So do you know about this animal here, the beaver? They don't have them in Egypt, do they? No. Yeah. So, so in North America, uh, we have these animals. Uh, they're big, maybe this long, a meter or so, maybe a half a meter. And uh, they're rodents, so he has this big tooth there. And they use that tooth to gnaw down a tree. So this is something you've heard of. The beaver, they make a dam. They gnaw the tree, they knock it down, and they build a, a dam. So we say they're nature's engineers. So therefore, they're the, the favorite animal of MIT. Okay. And I'll tell you that it, for, the, for the winners of this year's Robocon, we'll receive uh, cast metal beavers around, uh, uh, you know, like, like an Olympic medal, you know, you'll have it on a ribbon, and you'll be able to bring it home. Okay, so the beaver is important to us. They work really hard, and they build things. So that's, that's something that we embrace. Okay, so this beaver is sick, and uh, we're taking care of some of his ailments, because there was, there's a game that's popular for us where you play like a doctor. Um, so we played on that to make a game. But if you were to implement something very much like 2007, you have to invent your own one of these. So I won't show you the game we're going to play this summer. That's a secret. Everybody sees it at the same time. On the first day of the contest, we'll reveal what it is that you're going to do. And we'll, there'll be a number of tasks, not unlike these, but each year a different one. And then if you decide to host GlobalCon <coughs> later, two years from now, four years from now, uh, then you will have to invent all these things. So think about that. Some furrows. Yes, you could have a pyramid. Yeah, you could have a sphinx. Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun. Yeah, yeah. Already the ideas are flowing. Okay. But it's not only about a game, it's really about mechanical design. Uh, before you, before you yes. go over yes. this, yes. uh, during the contest, will you, students are able to use, of course, other softwares like SolidWorks, stuff not necessarily to be CAD, right? Or it's yes. limited to CAD? They, they uh, can use any software they wish. Okay. okay. So it happens to be that uh, we do most of our instruction in SolidWorks. So the, we're assembling a team of instructors from MIT who are experienced helping 2007 students. They know SolidWorks and MATLAB better than any other packages. However, if you come and you happen to be most proficient in AutoCAD or Rhino or pick your favorite, we will try to help you as best we can. You are not constrained in any way. You can use the software that you want to use. Now, in the end, if you want to laser cut something, we have to translate it into a format that our machines accept. So maybe you'll churn your solid model into a line drawing and represent it in DXF, and then we'll bring it in and we'll cut it for you. But how it starts is up to you. And I would encourage you uh, to bring a laptop with the software that you're most comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you don't, if you're not able to, 
then when you arrive, we'll make an installation for you of SolidWorks or MATLAB, whatever you need. But that, that's time that we would take away from other things. So the more of these things you have ready, uh, the more efficient everything will be. Any questions about that? I mean, if you have any special requirements, please ask. Something like that. And, uh, uh, does anybody have the SolidWorks on his laptop or anybody coming with laptop? You? This is very important. So you can start from day one. He's asking about if there's teamwork, does it matter that they're using different softwares and the same team? Well, naturally there are some challenges that present themselves when you know one person makes a part in AutoCAD, another per person makes it in SolidWorks, and then you bring them together in a single assembly. But they're not insurmountable challenges. So I think it's okay. You can do as you wish. And maybe it's a good thing for the team to do. To, in the first meeting, say, would you like to standardize on certain formats? Or shall we just let everyone do what as they wish and then deal with the integration problem later? It's up to the team. In fact, if people only use paper and pencil the whole week, they might still do very well. It's really up to them. So that's the question about the teams. Uh, are we all going to be in the same team for the same university or something? Or we're going to switch like... Um... I believe that it's the case that uh, you will not have any other Egyptian on your team. In general, you'll be on a team of about five people. And that team will be as diverse as possible. Maybe one person from Japan, one from China, one from Brazil, one from MIT, one from Egypt, something like that. And this is actually one of the pluses of this program is that you get, get to interact uh, with people from different backgrounds, from, with different experiences, from different cultures. So it's just an added on to the learning experience. Yes. I think that in the future, you'll be working on international teams. So begin now and learn how to do that. So we could have had you know, Team Egypt versus Team Tokyo Tech. I think it's better. Let's have Team Purple and Team Brown. And they'll be as different as possible. And when you go away from this experience, you'll have at least five new friends. And you'll be emailing them for years to come. But I have to warn you that one of the potential challenges this creates is that on your team there may be not one language that every single person speaks. We can't be sure that every single person that is selected from say Tokyo Tech knows much English at all. So uh, sometimes you see teams working out an idea in what appears to be pantomime. But more and more, they can also go to, you know, Babel, Fish, or some translator, and uh, Google Translate. They manage pretty well. They manage pretty well. So we have a lot of experience with this. It is not easy, but it's certainly possible. It makes more exciting. I think it's more exciting. And it's the way of the world today. There's no point in trying to pretend it's something else. Okay, so one of the things that I can say about mechanical design at MIT, certainly, when we tell them this is mechanical design, I say, well, sure, it is this engine. This is an engine from a 1974 MG Midget. If you want to work on something that's only mechanical, you probably have to go back to a design from 1974. Because today, if you showed the engine from a modern car, half of it would be electronic, half of the value, maybe not half of the weight, but half of the value would be electronics and software. Uh, so 
You can see some fully mechanical designs. This is one that I developed along with uh, that new faculty member I was talking about who took over 207. We designed this wheelchair for going through rugged terrain. It's purely mechanical. There are not so many of these left. But we'll teach you about some purely mechanical things. You know this kind of gearing? Remember the name? Yeah, bevel gears, right? So we'll give you bevel gears. They'll be in the kit. They'll be in the inventory. And then there's gears inside of a package like this. Do you know what this one is called? Servo, Servo motor. motor. Yeah. So we're going to give you these. These combine the mechanical and the electronic both. That's the way of the world today. And then some things that are just electronic and software. An Arduino. You'll get an Arduino and a carrier board in your kit, and you'll integrate it into your designs. So for us, this is mechanical design today. We very rarely design anything in 2007 or in any other course that's only mechanical anymore. And that may be different from what you're experiencing now, and we'll decide whether that is something that we want to adopt, to just allow the two to be blended right from the start. It's something to consider. The reason is that here are our learning objectives. One of, one of the things that we very much emphasize at MIT and in CDIO is at the beginning of a program, define your objectives. At the beginning of a course, Define your objectives. And these are the ones from 2007, slightly amended. You see dots here and there. But after taking the subject, the biggest one is you should be able to generate, analyze, refine, to design, to design a new thing. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to take the kinds of elements that you use fasteners, springs, belts, chains, shafts, but also sensors and electronics. We just put it in the list as if. They're just another element to be understood, to be utilized. What do you have to be able to do? You have to be able to say what it can do, <clears throat> say how it might be used, understand how it performs, why would it fail, all the way through. Then apply experimentation. If you think you can analyze it and know what it can do from first principles, great. But more often than not, our experience is that sometimes you do an experiment and you learn that uh, actually there's some inadequacy of the model. You need to improve it further. So we want people to know how to do experimentation and communicate. So one of the things that we can do in taking our experience here is to write a set of objectives for your course. What do you want your second year design, mechanical design course to be? And I recommend start with objectives. Now, CAD instruction is one of the things that we uh, emphasize in 2007. We don't have a course about CAD. That's one of the differences that I've noticed also between your existing programs and what MIT does. We don't have a course that says learning CAD. We have just 2007 and we start using CAD. Here's an example of a model that an MIT student made with no CAD instruction. We said, go, do the tutorial. 14 weeks later, he makes that model because we had to crush cans in this course. So I saw can crushers in the last few days, and I saw can crushers back then. They're both good can crushers. But this one, without specific CAD and drawing instruction, yours with, okay? So this note is for you. Again, you know, please bring a laptop with the programs you expect to use. Maybe I can escape from this for a second. I want to show you a video. I hope it will work OK. So here is the young man who made, uh, who made that can crusher. Get it to start. He's telling you about his experience in Tulsa. Hi, uh, my name is Blake Sessions, and I'm here to show you my 2007 robot. So basically, it's a can crusher. You can see Sorry about I don't know what's the bottom. Happening. We have a homemade pneumatic cylinder here, um, a big linear bearing to keep this section in line, and then here's the section where the uh, can is crushed. On top here, it, over it gets out of the way uh, for the can to get crushed. So here it is in action. We Roll over the can, just like that. Can gets crushed against the block. 
finish it off. And then at the end, the can needs to get put into a slot. So once it finishes depressurizing, which is right about now, and there it goes. So it has to be crushed, put in a slot. That's about so it. So it kicks um, it through. Yeah. I've had fun doing it. It's, it's what I enjoy doing. So thanks. Yeah, so there's an MIT student. That's what they're like. He said he had fun doing it, and it's what he likes to do. So we, we hopefully didn't crush his spirit in the 14 weeks that we had him. But he got a lot done. I thought that was a good machine. Any questions about that? Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. Maybe it's a question for our students okay. here. Uh, there is uh, one thing that we have found uh, different from what we are teaching at Ain Champs University, for example, mm -hmm. and what is at MIT that uh, Professor Dan has pointed out here, that uh, we are teaching a lot of uh, drawing courses. You have uh, drawing uh, in the preparatory year, and you have drawing in mechanical, in the first year mechanical, uh, mechanical drawing. And what we found uh, that they don't have any courses dedicated to drawing. Uh, this is something that you should learn by yourself. It's something like MATLAB. So what do you think about this? Do you have any, I'm asking this because if we switch to the MIT model, maybe we don't delete all the three drawing courses that we have, but at least reduce them. So does anyone have any I feedback do. about this? I, I believe this is much better if you make the student learn how to draw by himself rather than getting him a dedicated course. Because this is where I came from in England as well. They don't give a specific drawing course for their students. They let them know this by themselves. So I think it uh, reducing, well, it's my target to reduce the number of hours are target to me. So as much as you reduce the load, the stresses on the students, that it, it, is, it does make more sense to me. What about feedback from students? I still have. They take no no drawing courses or no CAD drawing courses. No drawing. No no drawing, okay. no specific course on engineering drawing with that label. I mean, we do discuss engineering drawing within 207, but there is not a course that is named engineering drawing, which you take to learn, for example, you know why is uh, this line solid and not dashed, right? We we tell them that in 207. A line is dashed when it's hidden. A line is solid when you look at it from the front and you would see the edge. And we, we give them assessments on that. It's on the exam. But we don't have a whole course about it. And the reason is that once I make this solid model, so I drew this part, and then I said, give me two views of it and put the dimensions on. This step here was almost entirely automatic, right? I had to, you know, in SolidWorks, I had to move these dimensions to the places that I liked. Uh, but I just didn't have to pull out a, a sheet and figure out how to draw the different lines. This is much more automated than it once was. And for us, if it can be automated, I'm less inclined to spend time teaching it. Okay. Uh, in the uh, previous, uh, you learned about the, the projection and the section. I think it's uh, very helpful. Uh, uh, in high school, we don't have any idea about uh, such as this topic. Uh, but in the first year of mechanical design, uh, assembly drawing uh, didn't add any value. And uh, it was a waste of time get tasks and uh, draw uh, and drawings. Uh, but uh, in the first year, it's uh, add value. That's my opinion. Anyone else has any? It's actually, I have the same opinion, like the one we study in the preparatory year is really important, but after this, the assembly courses and stuff, they are not important at all. I have to disagree, opinion. because it, it, it is important for you as a mechanical engineer, but we give it to all students, no matter what his future will be. I mean, we give, we give for foundation drawing, very hard drawing, very sophisticated and details, and he's still not decided what to go. He could be civil engineer, he could be architecture. Uh, so we give them load, without uh, reason for that. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, we have to think about once again, we have to give them, if we decide to give them a course dedicated to drawing, then he has to be a mechanical engineer to take this load. 
we start from the early beginning. <laughs> I want to point out a resource for you. This website here, I, I keep speaking of the one with the beaver on it. Okay, so this was the course the very last time that I taught 2007. It has changed since. You could look at them too. But this one, stellar.mit.edu. S for, uh, for spring, I'm sorry, for uh, summer course to spring 13, 2007. All that URL is uh, in the slides, right? And it's available to you. If you go here, I have made the setting so you have access to everything. If you go to the site, you can click on everything I can click on. So if you go to materials, I click on materials, and you can see, well, subject policies won't be so important for you, but all our CAD models, all our required readings, a, a set of notes I made about DC motors, how the project was structured into 11 milestones, the homework that we gave, the contest rules are no longer so important, uh, some videos, and then all the lecture slides. All the lecture slides are there. And then I want to show you one more thing. If you look, say, at exam number two, here's exam number two that we gave in 2012. So you know how we grade also. If you want to see, it's all available for you. And you see what kind of questions we ask on an exam. Okay, so there's an example. A machine, how does it work? Which one gives you the best mechanical advantage? Low T for a fixed weight. You decide which machine is the best one. Here's a more complicated machine. Answer a question about that. We continue. How, do, how much uh, energy is stored in a battery? How do you uh, choose a spur gear? What are these things? Which one is the planetary gear set? This one? Oh, good, because those are planets. Okay, and this is the sun. Okay. Well, knowledge begins with at least knowing the names of things. Okay. But you see also, Drawing, here's a question about drawing. Make a three-view engineering drawing of the object below. We did ask them. You, they did not have to know how to do it. But we just didn't teach them. Well, we taught them through the project. We said, you want to make this part. You'd like to go to the lathe and cut out this part. Well, you, you're going to need a drawing for that. Make it. And then we check their drawing, and then they make the part. And then you see the mixtures. Uh, there's fluids. There's a circuit. I don't make it stabilize and just go to where I want. It just refuses to go to that spot. OK, so here's a question. You see a circuit. You know what that is? Light emitting diode. Here is photoresistor, and then a piece of code. And the question is, when the light intensity increases the voltage of pin A0 drops, true or false? So you have to look at it, understand it, and answer the question. So we, we also, we have you designing, but we also check to see what, what do you know? What have you learned from design? This is the style that we have adopted. All the materials available to you so you can decide if this is the style you want to adopt, okay? And we will help you to decide. Any questions about that? Okay, so in RoboCon, you know, there's no grading, right? Uh, we're just doing the designs. We have the contest. We see who scores the most points. At MIT in Turbo 7, the grade you receive and how you score points in the contest are almost completely uncorrelated. But when you bring this back to your university, they will still want to assign grades. The way we do it is through a design notebook and the exams and the homeworks. Uh, this note is for you, since we like the idea of using a design notebook, 
something to make clear what your process was. That will be useful for us too because we're interested in taking the things that happened in the contest, the thing that we're going to do in early August. We would like to take things that happened there and turn them into materials for your university. So if we have them in a notebook, we have a much better chance of making a lesson out of it. So if you can take the time to, for example, here's an example of a design notebook. Okay. Here's a design notebook made by an MIT student. She wanted to crush a can. She blew a can. She sort of showed a leaf screw. The dancing this plunger down. This was, it says here, design number four. So she developed multiple alternatives and explained why she chose one. If we have those kinds of things, options, rationale, and a final selection, that will help us to create new materials from us. OK, so I already said, here's the course website. Uh, there is the URL. It's available to you. I think 2013 has enough, but I can give you others if you need it. That's the course website. I mentioned the, the software we tend to use. Most often, we use SolidWorks for CAD, MATLAB for analysis, and then embedding programs into our machines, we use something very like C, not quite C that is loaded onto the Arduino. All those things are available to you. Please bring a laptop, and if you did install SolidWorks, that would be great. Any questions about that? All right, some of the things, when, when you are at MIT, you'll have many things available to you. This is just a sampling. You'll have servo motors, you'll have materials like aluminum extrusions that you can build structures out of. You'll have a microcontroller with a carrier board that we ourselves designed to give you the kinds of access that you want in a prototyping area. You'll have a particular budget, a volume of 3D print material that you can make parts of any shape that you want. So that's just a sense of what the kit is like composed of many diverse things. I already showed you Blake and his example. You'll be using, when you arrive, a wide variety of different machines and manufacturing capacities. So many of them are very simple. You must have used a bandsaw and a drill press, maybe a belt sander. Those are things that uh, will be available very easily to you. We'll have them uh, out with relatively little supervision for you to use those kinds of machines. We also have things like lathes and mills. Those being more powerful, we probably have more staff supervision in the use of those, but they're available to you to use. Also things that work as services, like if you want to laser cut something, one of the options is you get some orientation on the laser cutter, or one person from your team does, however you want to do it, and then you can just go in if there's no one waiting in the queue, you go right up to the machine, put in your drawing, set the focus length, set the speed that you want for the thickness of the material, and you cut. We'll tell you all about the safety procedures we have involved, like you need to attend to your job while it's cutting, because we find they start on fire more often than you'd like. So someone needs to be there to put it on, if it happens. So those are the kinds of machines that we typically have available to you. Uh, I'm giving you this resource. This is a URL for a website that I set up so long ago in the early 90s, just to explain the basis of machine shop practice. And there you'll find descriptions of the different kinds of cuts that you might want to make and how to set up the cuts and little video clips. It's available to you if you want, if you'd like, you know, refresher over the next couple of weeks. But we're going to teach you what you need when you're there. And you'll, you'll want to see the particular machine you're working on, I'm sure. All right. Now, I'm going to explain the 2013 contest. Not, not because the rules of that contest are important, but because you'll someday want to create your own contest. And in every one of these, there are different 
ways to score that you know that we set up. So, for example, uh, we asked them to pull a little butterfly shape out of the stomach, right? And we had them do it through a slot. So this was a mechanical operation, which was mostly focused on precision. So you wanted to be able to go through a slot to be able to grasp and manipulate and then come back through the slot. So if you were designing a new laparoscopic surgery equipment, those are exactly the kinds of skills that you would need, the kind of challenges you would face. So we put one on the table. Then I said before, this one required putting energy into rubber and then positioning it. Mostly it's finding a way to get a good match between the power demands of the task and the power available for your machine through gearing. Here is one uh, that is in the purely electromagnetic domain. You can't see it, but underneath the forehead of the beaver, there were uh, pieces of iron with wire wound around them. And before the contest, in each case, we would electrify them in a certain pattern. There was a grid, and that, that grid would be selectively energized so that it made the letters I, H, T, F, or P, or the numbers 2, 7, or 0. So when you get to MIT, you can ask the students, what does IHTFP mean? Because it's a very common expression at MIT. So you'll want to learn about that. Any questions about the kinds of tasks that you're going to be facing? Some electromagnetic, some for sensing. There's positioning. So if you wanted to read an I, and there are a bunch of magnetic fields under the table, how do you do it? You could scan back and forth. You could have an array of sensors, place it on. It's up to you. Thank you very much for Professor Dan for the lectures of each details for all the or something else. Mm -hmm. but, but by the way, I <coughs> I'd like to mention from the video you showed it, it is a competition from NASA. It is already do it from NASA competition, and one of my, my in my, my faculty of engineering at University, uh, assistant lectures, gained the second level from this competition, exactly from the NASA. Named Ayman Ragab, engineer Ayman Ragab, it is the second level for the NASA competition. So it is, maybe it's easy and uh, enthusiastic for the old students to do it. I hope that. So that's a great. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, so we try to learn from organizations that are the best, and we think NASA is one of the best. Okay, so now we move on to Robocon. That was all about 2007. Robocon emerged from 2007. Even before I started teaching it, someone had the idea hey, we're making this contest, let's have a contest with everyone from all over the world. A guy named Harry West put that together. So, 30 years ago, they launched it, and now they're very excited, actually, that, that this is the 30th anniversary. And uh, so, I think that you'll see that the organizers are talking about that a lot. They're really happy, and they want to play it up very strongly. So, 30th anniversary. I said, small teams of international composition. So, you'll either be assigned to a team already, or you'll draw a color from a hat, and you'll be put on a team, blue, orange, there'll be a color code. And in fact, when you are assigned to that team with that color, we'll give you like three or five t-shirts of that color, so that if you put them on and come to the shop, we know which team you're in, we know that you're part of Robocon, and if, you know, if someone is there who shouldn't be, we can ask them if they should be there, so it helps if you just wear the t-shirts all week. So that's the way it's typically done for us. So we put you on the small teams. Here are some sites that can give you information about Robocon generally. There's one that is the overall IDC Robocon, the whole history, every time it's been hosted, but not a lot of details about the particular competition, how it went. I'm also giving you the 2019 site, which has our specific agenda, and the 2011 site, which has 
a fully populated site with all of the materials, right? So the 2011 site shows you the rules from that year and the kit contents of that year. I'm waiting to put them on the 2019 site because it should be a secret and it should be revealed to everyone at the same time. But if you want to see what the site will look like in two weeks hence, the 2011 site is useful for that. I'm using the same structure, stellar system, to organize. So that's a resource for you. Robocon is international. Here are all the countries. We get a flag quiz now, right? So in the upper left, the green with the yellow. Brazil. Brazil, OK. China. Egypt. Egypt, OK. So it was alphabetical, I guess. B, C, E. Yeah, oh, no, we it. should start from this side of yeah, this way. That's the way we read. Oh, sorry. So it's alphabetical if you're reading English. <laughs> Otherwise, OK. So Egypt here. Any more? Japan. Japan. South Korea. Mexico. Mexico. That's a harder one, huh? Singapore. Thailand. You sure it's not Netherlands? No, it's not. No, it's Thailand. It's similar. <laughs> and, okay, U.S. That should be it. Very international. It's about design. So design, these are some of the past instructors saying what they think of as design, informed creative thinking, based on people's value, and expressing your passion, I hope. <coughs> the word contest says, according to the dictionary, it's about a struggle for superiority and winning. Actually, Robocon is not like that at all, I'll tell you now. It's just, maybe it's different this year, but it hasn't been in the past. You put the people on the teams that are from everywhere in the world, and you know, they try to design something really good, and they're, they're competing. You know, if you think about the kind of competition you have in world-class football, people are very aggressive, right? They're tackling each other. Uh, this is more like a volleyball game at the beach. People are just enjoying, they're trying to do well and they're trying to win, but it's really not too cutthroat. When one team is having trouble, the other team helps. That's the kind of thing it is, just so you know. Okay, this is the agenda, okay? Just the first little part of the agenda. I can take you through step by step. Okay, that's a little easier to do in Word instead of uh, the agenda. The first day. Some of this will be covered more by Norham, but uh, you'll arrive. We'll get you to the dorms. We'll get you to the hotel. Then, Monday morning, at 7.30, Someone like me, I'll go to the dorms. Make it larger, okay. View, zoom, page width. I'll go to the whole page width. And I'll spread out the width. Of course, you will all receive a, a detailed copy of this agenda. Yeah, you will, you will. But just in case there are questions that I can yeah. address now. So, I mean, you're, you're, I'm gonna take you over and we're gonna go to a classroom and we're going to tell you, we'll finally reveal the contest and what the theme is and how you'll score. You'll be put onto your teams, you'll have your t-shirts. Then, right away, you have team meetings. You know, you can talk to each other about your interpretation of the rules and how you think maybe you'd like to go about it. And you'll, of course, have questions. You'll wonder, what does it really mean to put X over Y? Can we bring it from the top? Can we bring it from the side? Okay. Uh, and you'll ask us those questions. We'll answer your questions even that same morning. You'll have lunch. Then we'll break into parallel sessions. So there, this is a pattern you'll see a lot. We can't do everything with everyone at the same time, so we assign you to different activities based on your color. So if you're on Team Navy, that means dark blue, almost black, or Team Red or Team Kelly Green, that's dark, a dark color green, if you're on any one of those teams from 1300 to 1345, you go and learn about this one facility we call the International Design Center. And you'll go up there and you'll see what that looks like. And if you're Navy, then later you'll go to Studio 7. And then after that, to the Safety Tower. And then after that, to have your team meeting. You'll 
go to different places at different times so that you're never too crowded. So it tends to look like that. Then also, a similar pattern follows. On Tuesday, we're actually going to make things, if you're ready to make things, some early prototype. And half of the people go to this facility, and half of the people go to this facility, depending on their color, right? So if you're Team Aqua, you go to Studio 7. If you're in Team Gray, you go to the International Design Center, which is up north, and we'll show you a map, okay? And then, at lunch, you switch between the lunchtime and the afternoon session. If you are in yellow, then you switch from Studio 7 over to IDC. So every day the switch happens at lunch. Then, at the end of the day, at 1700, you have all your work that you have been uh, doing throughout the day. You can just leave it. Leave it out on the table. Neatly, but you know, you just leave it where it is. Because the very next morning, you'll be in the same place. So we go forward to Wednesday. Where are you? If you were yellow, then once again, you're at the IDC again. So you left your things behind, and then you switch again at lunch. The one thing that tends to extend far into the evenings is availability of the table. So you see this, 1900 to 2300. If you want to go and do some experiments on the table, there's just a, a room where the table is, the door is open, you're free to go in. Just in case there's crowding, we'll have a sign-up sheet. Team yellow signs up for the green side of the table. Team purple signs up for the green side of the table for a half-hour blocks. So, you know, you can take dimensions. You can, there'll be a solid model of the table available, but you may want more details. You may want to do physical experiments or just get the sense of it or just have a team meeting where you can relate right to the contest table. That's how it will work. So that's the agenda. You'll have, you'll, you'll have this printed out in multiple forms. It's also available on the Stellar site. I don't need to go into every single detail. And in the main. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so that's the agenda. Okay, now on the agenda also, we'll see that there is on Monday, August 5th at noon, the staff, including the graduate students from, uh, from all of the universities, including all the Egyptian universities, will go to a lunch together to talk about how things are going, but primarily to plan for the future. And at that time, if you feel that uh, you're comfortable, that this is something you'd like to do, you can raise your hand and say, we would love to host in 2021, 2023. You can decide what you'd like to do. But that's our chance to plan for the future. If you would like to become part of that Robocom family, I think they would welcome you. All right, now, RoboCom will be that first two weeks, and we'll have the chance to engage in designing. You'll make something. You'll work with that team. You'll have a lot of fun. You'll succeed. And then we step back, and we have time to ask ourselves, OK, given them what we just saw, what fits into our context, given what your industry sector needs, given the nature of the people that you bring into your universities? What are the parts that we should bring in? And what are the parts we should change before we bring in? And what are the things that maybe we'll say no thank you? The point is to take those things and bring value to the university. Now, because we have a whole week ahead of us, I'm I'm making an ambitious goal. I would like to not only look at the things that we want to pick out and bring in, I would like to implement in detail some of those things as far as we can to make instructional materials. Now, uh, the format that I have in mind for the instructional materials follows a pedagogy from a program called Blossoms. Now, when we actually begin that third week, I will tell you much more about Blossoms. 
but I want to give you just an overall gestalt for this, okay? It's a video library. It's a video library created by people at MIT, but also from all over the world. Uh, they use the video to set up actual hands-on engagement. This is an example here. I made this video about doing something called three position synthesis of mechanisms. That's something you teach? Okay. So I provided a lesson on how to do this. And it's in the video. Um, the material, if you sat through it straight through, the video would only take about 20 minutes. But it's designed for a one hour session. So the video just stops. You press stop. You hit a black screen, you press stop. And at that point, the video has set up an interaction. We pose a question. Like in this particular video, at one point, I will say, imagine that the distance on the mechanism between here and here is three, and the distance here and here is four, and this distance is five. Can you infer what is the angle between this part and that part? So that's an opportunity for the students to take some knowledge they have, of just geometry in this case, and apply it to a machine. So the students do that activity, applying mathematics to engineering design right there in the session. And what I would like to do is, we're going to have a videographer present, not continuously, but periodically through the first two weeks. This fellow named Gerald Gelfand and his team from Boston Digital Video, they'll be capturing video of things that happen. Like, you'll build a machine, and what happens if at some point your machine reaches out for something and then it tips over on its base? We can say, oh, we got that on video, that's interesting. We want to explore that. Why did that happen? Then later we can say, make a video. How to know when a robot is stable or unstable? and then just explore what does that mean. What did that phenomenon tell us about how to apply engineering to design? And I hope also, in addition, you would have made a note in your notebook. The robot tipped over when I reached. What is the countermeasure? Then you build a little arm that goes down and touches the ground, stabilizing. You know, as you often see, if you see construction equipment, when they drive, they have a more compact footprint, then they get to the site and these little arms come up. <coughs> then they start to carry heavy things high up. You can do something similar on your robot. The point is that whatever interesting lesson there is, we capture it, we convert it through the best pedagogy we can find and deliver it to the students to make it efficient. Make some materials that you would be happy to have and use at your universities? No, no question. Yes? During the course, there's uh, three categories of classes about uh, uh, graduate student, uh, undergraduate student, graduate student, and uh, faculty. What is uh, the activity output of each uh, group of these three groups? Okay, so we've got faculty, graduate students, and then uh, undergraduate students. Okay, so let's go through it. In Robocom, the undergraduate students will be assigned to the teams with the colors, and they will build robots in the contest. They will live in the dorms with everyone who is in the same situation. The faculty and the graduate students will not be assigned to those teams. They will live in the hotel and they will be part of the instructional staff. They'll be part, along with me, and the lecturers and the graduate students from MIT, and we will help the teams when they need it. We'll watch what they're doing, give them advice whenever it seems to be warranted, and also, at that same time, we're thinking metacognitively. How is the help that I'm giving now relevant to my university? What training can I provide to the next graduate student? Right? So when a faculty member is there with a graduate student from your own university, from our university, let's say we behave just as if we were in a course and I was the instructor and this is a TA and we work together as a team. 
to help the students be as successful as possible, to learn as much as possible. Is that a good answer? Okay, so there's a Blossoms website that you can go visit, blossoms.mit.edu. You could go watch the video I just described about simple machines. There's another one I made about estimating quantities of energy, by the way, good energy topic. Uh, but many, many others. There are hundreds of videos, right? So this one, the Monty Hall problem, how to use Bayesian statistics to play a game better. Any topic that would connect to mathematics, physics, chemistry, any STEM, you know, in the US we use the acronym STEM to mean science, technology, engineering, math. That's a term that we use in high schools and, yeah, mostly high schools, uh, for that kind of instruction as opposed to humanities. Um, so Blossoms focuses on STEM, You'll, you'll notice that most of the instruction is at the level of an advanced high school student. But truthfully, uh, if you aim material at an advanced high school student, it's also quite useful in the first year of university as well, maybe past. Like, you can see I, I did three position synthesis. I don't know what year you do three position synthesis in, in, in Shams, but for us it's not even first year, it's more advanced than that. So the Blossoms website, in addition to having all the videos, it has a description of a process for making the video. And that includes writing a concept. So there, a concept would be maybe just a paragraph. You would say, I have some video that shows a robot falling over. And I have this idea about describing the conditions that a robot falls over. You find the center of gravity, you find the points of contact with the floor. You form something called a convex hull. We describe those things. Okay, that's our concept. We're going to teach what is a convex hull. Uh, that's the concept. It's short. We could probably do it on the first day of the third week. Then write the architecture. The architecture is a more detailed, maybe three pages of description. The architecture would tell you what you wanted to set up in the first segment. The first segment, you'll describe the idea of a robot falling over, you'll describe the idea of a center of mass, and then you'll have an exercise for people to do. You have to say what that exercise is going to be. And then you do that for the next segment and the next segment, all in writing. That's something, three pages, maybe we could have one by Tuesday, actually three. I'm hoping we can make three videos. We'll break up into small teams and start crafting our lessons. Then a pseudo script, a teacher's guide, and videotaping, that's ambitious. I'm, when I go home by Friday, I'm going to meet with the director of Blossoms. I'm going to talk about just how far we can hope to go. If we're lucky, we can actually have a, 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 a pseudo script and film a couple of blocks of, of the video. The rest of the video we can do over the subsequent months. We can set up a, a, a videographer here instead of only Gerald. But my aim may be over ambitious, but I set a target. Three videos that would be useful to you all teaching about some topics in using a methodology that I think is well proven, the Blossoms method. So if you have time, I could show you what an architecture looks like if you want, but I have plenty of time I can show you when we get there and after we're done with what will come. So would you like to see some of it now? Because not everybody attending is going to be joining the, the program, okay. so it will be useful. Okay, and we'll show Yes. Yes, I about the three videos you are mentioning. There are three topics. Uh, this is not part of the competition, so we can decide before going, perhaps, 
which are the topics that we wish to do. Yes, that's true. For some reason, I had in my mind that we would just see the things that happened in the two weeks, and that would inspire us. But you also could definitely decide ahead of time, certain things we know are going to happen, right? Uh, or we know can be illustrated through RoboCon. So yes, if you would like to, you can. Okay, so here's the Blossoms website. Just to give you an example of um, navigating through, if you pick on engineering, uh, here is an example about uh, video in the kitchen, but I'm gonna try to find the video on um, the video on designing simple machines. It's not the fastest connection. We'll get there. Okay, here we go. Engineering. slow so I'm gonna while it's finding it I'm going to show you this is what a blossoms architecture looks like okay batteries the wings of modern technology so she's going to explain to you how batteries work this is a chemistry teacher from China she says segment one now she wrote out exactly what she wanted to say you wouldn't have to do that you could write something much more sparse here uh, just generally I'm going to explain how batteries power many different things and, um, and that they're based on many different kinds of chemistry. And then here's the experiment. Activity one, you need a piece of fruit, you need zinc, copper wires, and a galvanometer. So you explain what are the materials needed for the activity and then you say what the experiment is that is set up by uh, segment number one. So an architecture is something like three pages written in a format like this explaining an educational activity. Now this particular one was set up so that high school teachers even in remote locations, so some rural village in Pakistan, they can do this. They can find a piece of fruit and some wire. You could choose to make one that is a little bit more technologically sophisticated but maybe not as accessible to everyone. But our aim was, if we could find a way to make it very accessible, we would. It's really about batteries. Chemistry is the same, whether it's a lemon and a piece of copper uh, or something more sophisticated. So that is what an architecture looks like. And then, once you have the architecture set up, you can find the video. Okay, the science behind music. Oh, there's me. I want to show you a feature that I think is useful. I can choose, if I want, I can speak Arabic. That's good. I can't, I can't do it, but I can seem like I'm doing it. All right, so I've chosen it. I'm going to pick here. Will it work? Not the, best, not the best connection, but I believe in a moment I'll be speaking Arabic. Okay. Not much Arabic do you know so far. I know so little, it's sad. <laughs> I'm sorry. You <laughs> should. I know, I know. I'll, I'll have to get... Um, what is the best program? Was that a song? So one of the things we always teach about uh, Blossoms is that if you don't have the best video connection, you can download the videos ahead of time. <laughs> I wasn't sure which one you'd want to see. So I gave myself flexibility, but I pay the price and bandwidth. So there it is. Marco 
بودم در فرایی استادان فی جامعات مسجد چاسه بسید و سر تحدف آن تصمیم الالیت سيكون هذا الدرس مفيدا لانه سيوفر لكم فرصة عملية للتفكير بعمق بكيفية عمل الآلات. يعتمد هذا الدرس على معرفتك بالهندسة، خاصة الحدائق المتعلقة بالدوائر والمثلثات. وكما يتضح أن هذا النوع من الهندسة متعلق بعلم الحركة، الحركيات، الذي نستخدمه كمهندسين. فالحركيات هو علم الهندسة المتحركة وستبقى. Okay, so one, one of the things you'll notice is a, I decided to make the video in English and have it dubbed over in Arabic. You can do the opposite if you want. It's really up to you. Right. So I, I think we prefer the English version. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then I try to think of ways to have something hands-on. In this case, you know, these boards are available in lots of places. Like in, in the United States, you would you put one on the wall of your garage and you put little hooks to hang your tools. So I think they're pretty widely available. And, and then you can make links out of them so you can make attachments between them and then you've got a mechanism. So I try to create a hands-on thing that goes along with the video. So any questions about a Blossom video? What they look like? So hopefully we'll make a number of those. So then, uh, you have, I, as I see, that you have 12 groups, right? Yes, we have 12 groups of about five each. Yeah, and uh, how do you create the groups? Well, two things. Uh, we, the person working with me, Dawn, she said, I believe I can do the best job forming teams. Send me a list of all the names, and I will form them into groups that are very international, that have the right mix of genders and all the things that she was concerned with. So I said, go ahead and try to do that. But one thing that can sometimes happen is, sometimes people have trouble with their visa, now you get a different group than you thought you were going to get. So I said, as a backup plan, if, if we lose a lot of people from the visa process, we're just going to make a hat. And the hat will have, let's say, you put all the Japanese and Chinese in one hat, with a mix of colors. That way, you know that you spread them out. Okay. Right? So that there isn't one team that has a lot of Japanese and Chinese. So uh, we'll try to diversify through what is in statistics called a stratified sample. So randomization, but a restriction on randomization. So it will be either you'll show up and we'll just be told what team it is, because Don figured out the best team, or because we had some changes in the travel plans, we will randomize right there on the spot with color sheets and a hat. One of those two. I don't think it's a good idea to put Chinese and Japanese in the same group. <laughs> oh, in the same hat even? It could no. be a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you see the point. We have to make sure that probably there aren't more than one or two Japanese students on every team. There will have to be a mix of nationalities in every hat because there will only be, say, uh, 12 hats and will populate. Do you know how many nationalities so far you have in this contest? We have nine nationalities, but more like 17 different schools because there are maybe four Egyptian, uh, two Japanese, three Chinese, and so on. So, we talked about the agenda. Oh, we did not talk about the agenda of week three. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a sense of that. A sense of that is that um, in week three, we're going to start on Sunday because I know that's part of your week, work week. Uh, so, we'll start off right and early. On Sunday, you will have had a Saturday off, okay, one day. Uh, and then we will talk about the purpose of the week and explain the Blossoms pedagogy so I can refresh that and go into much more detail. Uh, we're going to watch some specific videos all the way through end to end, actually do a Blossoms lesson. We don't have time for it today, but then we'll actually do a Blossoms lesson from end to end. We'll pick one that we like. Then after lunch, we'll look through footage of 
the events that happen during the week, see what nuggets we have there that we can work from, and then by the end of the day, we're already brainstorming ideas for our own blossom lessons. Then in the next day, we're picking out the best ideas, flushing them out, and then the rest of the agenda looks like much the same. Getting up at 8 in the morning, going to the next phase, building a concept, then building an architecture, then making some video. And that takes us through to the end of the week. But I also included in every day some lab visits. I said, look, we don't have to pack every day with just making new material. These people are at MIT. I bet they would like to see something. So if there is a lab that you would like to see, I can set it up individually or in small groups. And if you, if I gave many of you my card already. If I haven't already, if I haven't done so already, I'll give you a card now. And then over the next couple of weeks, if you see a lab on the MIT website and it's interesting to you, let me know and I'll try to set up a visit for you during those slots that I planned for week three. Do you plan for the power station as well? The power station, so that was something you got to see on the study tour. Do you recommend it? Yes, I think it's good for the students to see the yeah, how so MIT actually has a power station for actually producing electricity to the campus, to the whole city. Yeah, we have a central utilities plant it burns natural gas and then produces electricity, chilled water, steam. And yeah, it's a fun thing to see. I've seen it many times. So I'd be happy to set that up too. <coughs> you said something about 24 hours a day, but you never said anything about seven days a week. Well, this is Sunday. Six about days. <laughs> Saturday you are free. Saturday, Saturday you are free. <laughs> okay. no, <I'm> <laughs> you said about we would we'll be working 24 hours a day. Yeah, I know, it's rough. Days a week. <laughs> it's rough. Many, you know, MIT has a very liberal employment policy. You can work any 80 hours per week that you want. You can pick them any way you like. Any 80 hours that you want. You, you're free to choose as you wish. Okay. So that was my outline. I wanted to introduce you to the idea of CDIO tell you a little bit about the course 2007, how that translates to RoboCon, just a vision of roughly how things are going to go, because again, we're, we're going to see all this again. Everyone who's showing up at RoboCon did not get this briefing, right? They just show up and they find out from the beginning. So if anything was unclear, we're going to cover it again for RoboCon, and then also how at least my vision of how we can draw some things out of the agenda for the third week to deliver value for your universities. Again, the agenda, let's consider it a draft. If by the time the third week comes around, there's something better, just a better way to structure it, let's just sit down and talk, and I can make some adjustments. So we can add something for You can add, you can delete, okay. we can rethink. This was a draft because we have to have something, even at this stage. Uh, but we can be very flexible. Yes? Are the students are allowed to record videos during their work in the labs? Yes, they're free to... Actually, MIT is a very open place. There are only selected locations where you could not take video. Maybe there are a couple of places in the uh, power plant where you should not point a camera, and maybe a few labs, but mostly you're free to pull out your, your smartphone, uh, make your own videos. Gerald is going to be taking videos of all kinds of things. If you don't want something to be on video, for whatever reason, just let your preferences be known. And also for the, I mean, the, in our culture, people like to put their videos on Facebook or something like that. Yeah, our are culture they, too. Yeah. <laughs> are we allowed to do that? Yes, you are. Okay. As far as I'm concerned. Okay. You're allowed. Um, this Just is actually part of Norhan's orientation. She'll be covering um, permissions related to photography and videography and whatnot. Uh, I'd like to add one thing to what uh, Professor Dan has mentioned. This is for our team, faculty. Uh, 
TAs and uh, undergraduate students. Uh, our main objective of this is to bring new teaching technologies, <coughs> sorry, new teaching technologies and uh, strategies back to our universities. So always put this in your mind. How can we use what we see there to make the things better in, 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 when, we, when you come back? Uh, of course, this is the core uh, 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 function of the faculty who are traveling, the TAs, but the students, it will become a core function for you, objective. You have passed this. By the way, this 007 is the second year design course. It's equivalent to the second year design course. So all of you have already passed this course. Uh, please bring back, it's, it's good to get feedback from you. Uh, how we can make this better. You are all selected as a uh, few of the best uh, students at our university, so we will uh, value a lot your feedback. When you see things, please tell us. Uh, you will be part of the change. So tell us when you come back, uh, I want to do this, I want to change this. We have uh, heard a very interesting comment now about the mechanical drawing in uh, the assembly first year, coach. assembly, assembly and we will certainly consider this. Uh, so please always put this in mind, how we make things better. Uh, we will have, uh, which we have chosen you that you are in the third, uh, the students are in the third year, so st you still have one year to go at the university, so you still have time to influence uh, the change in this uh, basic course. We will change a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for being open to changing. Because I think there's a lot of opportunity. Yes, sir. Thank you. Like you said about grading the tool, uh, 2007, that uh, you have weight on the design notebook. I'm interested how we create something like that. Yes, that's an excellent question. Uh, so I think one of the best ways for us to handle that is when you arrive to MIT, I have stacks of the design notebooks that are already graded. So you see in some colored pen, an instructor has made a note. Uh, this, this structure is not well supported. I, I recommend adding something here. The notes that they give, and then the grade that they assign for that week. And that, for me, is the best way to describe how we grade, by the examples. And you'd be welcome to scan those in and take the examples with you, but uh, to start with, many, many examples are available to you during that week, so you can see how it's done. It's like a competitive uh, process. Well, it's a fairly individualized process. You have to admit that uh, students might notice that their section instructor is extra strict compared to the other section instructor. I have to admit there's some degree of variability but we try to meet periodically and make sure that we're treating the students fairly. Uh, but indeed, there's in some sense fairly individualized. Everybody is, you know, brings their own background to the assessment. But at the end of the course, one of the things you'll find is that MIT students don't talk very much about their grade at the end. Let, let me actually show you a little video of a bunch of students who are talking about what advice they would give to other students in, um, in Tudelosum. I think it's this one. Advice from the students, there it is. Save four hours in lab. After a lot of trial and error, uh, 
calculations may not always be all that we need, uh, and that trial and error solves a lot of problems. Have a simple design that's repeatable. Once you fall off the design horse, you just have to get back up and keep building. Learning how you use all the machines in the shop here, and especially the mill and the lathe, and really taking an idea, fabricating it, and seeing a final product. The wire jets, which is able to shoot sand really fast, and laser cutters, which burn good material. I really like 2007 because I have a passion for mechanical engineering design. <laughs> You know, what we do in those videos is we simply set up the, the classroom and we ask them to bring their robot and say, what do you want to tell to the next student? And this is the kind of thing they say. And they never mention grades. I don't know why. It's just not <laughs> something they're thinking about. Uh, we give them grades, uh, but it's just so much more interesting things to talk about than that. But indeed, it's, it's a thing that needs to be done, so we do it. And we want to show you in detail how we do it. It's interesting to me that their advice is actually very contradictory, right? One student said, you have to plan carefully to get a good result. The other one said, this is my fourth iteration through. And the other one said, sometimes the calculations you did don't work out, so you have to do some experiments. It can't all be true. Well, yeah. You know, so we also don't have a very strict uh, dogma about how to approach it. One person is more interested in planning, they plan carefully, great. The other student goes through faster, does a few cycles, also great. Uh, we are there to support them in the way that maybe they'll have their own style of being a designer. It's not up to me to choose. Any other questions? Did I make the note? I, there was a note flashed by if I didn't do it fast enough because this one will be hard to fix if we get it wrong. Uh, at least pack one pair of close-toed shoes. It's hot enough that you might like to wear sandals, but in the shop you have to wear closed-toed shoes. So pack at least one pair. Any other questions? I'm pretty close to the end of my time. Yeah, I was pretty much on time. Right on time. Good, good, okay. So thank you very much, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you.